For some ground rules, we ask that you please keep your questions short <laughs> and um, clear. And if you have, um, if it's directed at one of the speakers uh, tonight, if you could please um, just clarify who your question is directed to. Um, yes. And we do have a roving mic for the audience, and our presenters also have a mic. So now the floor is open. You could just have a uh, just indicate by raising your hand if there are any burning questions. If there are no questions, we can take a few comments. And I have to warn you, former teacher here, so any sign of fidgeting and hand movement may be interpreted <laughs> as interest in asking a question. So. <laughs> All right, I am, I'm um, very aware that either one of two things is happening. One, there are actually no questions. <laughs> two, everyone's waiting for the first person to ask the question. So that will break the ice and then you'll finally get to ask the question that you want to ask. Um, and I've often been in that position, sitting in the audience kind of wondering, should I, is it now? Should I ask that question now? I'm not sure, maybe I don't want to be the first. Um, so we ask, please, we're, we're only going to give you five more minutes. If there are any questions or comments, if anyone would like to call for the mic, could you please um, raise your hand? If not, we will close the program um, this evening. Yes, we do. Thank you. Thank you um, for the presentations. <laughs> um, <coughs> my name is James. Um, I have a question for the Secretary General, just, uh, uh, just to follow up on what you were sharing regarding um, the um, 2050 strategy. And um, as we know, uh, the regional consultations have, uh, have happened and the national consultations going on. Um, you reflected a little bit already in, in your in your um, keynote this evening, but I'm just wondering if you'd like to, maybe if there's anything else you would like to add on the significance of these alternative frameworks being offered um, at a time when we are looking, <coughs> trying to envisage where we want to be in 30 years' time as a Pacific Blue continent, Naka. My reality may not be your reality, James, <laughs> but <clears throat> if when I read the documents and um, last night I was reading the one that uh, Kunai had uh, written the forward to and the comments from people right across the region, you wanted to go somewhere and Things happen for reasons that, um, well, I believe that that um, the 2050 strategy is a process that is now have the, the leaders have asked that what does the, what do you envisage for the next 30 years, and it could even go further than that, huh? and I think that these books and what's it the content of them need to be considered by the member states. Now the current um, co-chairs are Fiji and Manawatu. Uh, national consultations have happened. Regional consultations have happened. I chair the Specialist Subcommittee on Regionalism, which is made up of representation of Polynesia, Micronesia, Melanesia, private sector, civil society, small island states. And 
Australia and New Zealand have represented you. And those discussions um, I found them valuable, but what you've done in these books adds a very different dimension. And it would be wonderful, or it would be not, a, not wonderful, but it would be very important that those perspectives are then reflected alongside other contributions that are being made. What we will do as part of the process is that we're working with SBC to look at how we're going to analyze all the data that comes to, to us so that we can pull it together and then look at what are the drivers, the drivers of change, and then at some point we will eventually get to one of the scenarios that will um, have to be developed. Um, and then, you know, over the next two years, what's it? No, it's not two years. I think Fiji wants to get this done by the next year when Fiji hosts the Pacific Island Forum meeting and to make sure that we've got a document that captures all this. I think that um, from where I sit, good policy making is important to have the input of consultations across, not just from governments, but from civil society. And this is why inclusivity is such an important part <coughs> of the work that we do now. Civil society has a conversation with the forum economic ministers. It uh, has, a, has a conversation with the leaders themselves, which has never happened, but over the years we've developed that now. And three times a year, Secretary General sits with civil society also to have conversations about issues that are really important. So. The content, the, the content of these uh, books that you've um, produced should, I think, um, uh, be presented to the co-chairs. Um, and I'm happy to help to facilitate that because I think it's really important that voices are heard. And I think that um, you yourself have been in discussions on the regional consultations. And if, tr if the years ahead, 2030 and beyond is going to have any meaning for people in the Pacific, these conversations that are happening now have to be captured. And they've got to be documented, but also it's not just to be regarded as idle commentary, but substantive contribution to rethinking what it is in the Pacific. So I'll leave it at that, but I'm Happy to help there. Do we have any other questions or comments from the floor? Uh, uh, thank you. Uh, my name is Akwa. I'm from Nauru, and I'm a USP student here. Um, I'm not sure if it's more as a question, but I like the fact that you, some of the speakers were mentioning that we need to embrace our cultural values. As a student, um, I believe that it's very important for us to remain attached to our cultures. But since there's a lot of drivers that have been like the advance of technologies, like for example, TikTok and all those Facebook, and uh, this is kind of like um, drifting us to another uh, modern age. But uh, I wanted to say that uh, for education purposes, that it's uh, some of the students that I heard that they've, in order for us to go to the future, we need to know our the, our roots of our culture. And in order for us to do that, for me like going around USB just to see all the, the art craft and the mat that symbolizes our culture. I think this is that um, can take us back to remind us of our culture. Even though that we go into the future, but just to put those, all those paintings and all those art craft in many ways. Um, and I hope that um, it continues to, be, uh, to remain like that because 
in the future, we don't know what's going to be ahead of us. But um, I just want to put that on the floor. So what do you guys think on that thought? <laughs> off and then I'll hand over. But there was a very interesting debate recently on, I think it was either on BBC or CNN about social media and how it contributes and what, it, uh, and what it's done. And it's the one issue that technology has done or social media has done is has led to the breakdown of our interpersonal relationships. This is so important for us in the Pacific. So what you say about knowing who we are knowing culture, but also keeping those relationships going is the most important. And it was also a very reflective commentary that people who are at the helm uh, of technology, those who live in Palo Alto and Oakland in California, do not let their children have access to this. Lesson learned for us. The number of children in the Pacific now you see who do not have a conversation with you because they are so completely addicted to um, their tablets. I, I raise this for one thing because I think this is the challenge that you've got. The writers in the book that, um, sorry, um, from the deeper, talk a lot about the value of our cultures going back, taking us back, etc. But we're going to fight that the whole way if we don't make some choices as individuals and as choices as parents. Yeah. Say something. <laughs> um, I don't think <coughs> I can argue against the importance of culture. It's very, very important. Um, and I did mention how difficult it is um, to put some of these ideas and stories into practice at this time in our region where there have been so many, many changes. And you've heard um, about the influence of social media. Um, it's going to be a fight all the way. So we have to find a way of using social media for our own advantage in terms of the transmission of whatever it is that we want to transmit to future generations. Because what I have found is that it's not so much the content of what we want to pass on that's important. It is the process. And that is what is always missing. Uh, you can have a course or lots of programs at the university, for example, on Pacific cultures and Pacific studies but if you are just standing out there and giving a lecture, if you're just using books, you're using the same process that is used for the transmission of other cultures, knowledge, and values. It's really not going to work. Especially if you're using another language, <laughs> using English, um, to teach about Pacific cultures or teach about your culture. It, it just seems to me ridiculous. And you're missing so much, as I mentioned, um, about the, the importance of language and how it expresses culture and values and knowledge. And you're using, like I'm using now, you know, I can talk about this salu salu I'm wearing in English and to try and explain to you how it came about. And you may have some knowledge of it, but, you know, if you ask the Fijian woman who made this, or whoever made the salu salu to explain in her own language how it's done, where she got the materials from. It's a totally different story. So if we're thinking of 2030 and what w our place may look like and what we might want to do, we have to think of how we are going to do this, the process of consultation. You know, we talk a lot about consultation and yet you know, a group of men sitting in an office can make a strategic plan for all of us, and we don't have a say in it. They might send it to us for comments, and like what Francis said earlier, any questions? No. Any 
comment on this paper that you got about our strategic plan for 2030 or whatever? No comment. Or you ask, you're asked to fill in a questionnaire with 30 questions online. It's going to take a while. So in the ministry, you're sending this to the Ministry of Education. Who's going to answer 30 questions? Do you give it to somebody to answer? No one answered. No one returned the questionnaire. So we are sitting somewhere and said, oh, no one answered. That meant they liked it. It's, it's no problem. So we will implement it. These are the kinds of processes that we use now in our region, in our universities, in our schools. So you've got to rethink not just what we want, but how we're going to get there. Think about the process. We've got to rethink the processes that we are using now, particularly if we're tra going to focus on ensuring that our young people learn about the important aspects of our culture. So we've got to do both. Think, list the kinds of things we want, how we are going to measure these, but we are also going to think of the processes that we will use because I think that's why we are still here talking about the same things we talked about 30, 40 years ago because we haven't actually changed the processes that we use. Thank you. And just to add to that um, and to give an example, um, I used to teach at the Fiji Institute of Technology and we introduced for the, the first time um, um, the teaching of uh, weaving, uh, pottery making, wood carving um, into the curriculum. And um, it was sort of got out into the news. And I think at that time it was Ratu Mara and uh, Andy Lady, Lady La, uh, um, his wife. And uh, they were like, wow, for the first time we're going to have teaching. Yay! But when, when it came down to it, it for the, for the, as, as uh, Kanai was saying, the teaching, the, the, the tutors were from Lao, and it was like, oh, yeah, way. So they were talking in their own language. And they were saying, no, 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 you can't do that. You have to, you, the, 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 the teaching must be done in English. And we're like, but it's cultural. And they were saying, no, 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 you, you must for trans, you know, transfer of knowledge and skills. And we're like, no, it's cultural. You, so it's changing that mindset, mm -hmm. changing the mindset, and uh, uh, um, not just the, the tutors, but the, the administrators. So the course ran for a while, and, and it was a, a course where 80 students came in and they, they looked at all aspects of um, the knowledge and skills and transmission with the tutors. But after a while, um, it, it depended on the political will of the organization. So then they decided that, oh no, th this is not bringing any income for us, you know, the, the, the generation um, of uh, um, finances to support the program, so we'll just scrap it, you know. So th this, this is the kind of um, issues that we have, you know, you can really have the, the policies in there, but if you don't have the, the political will, um, plans are there, but, uh, you know, what will happen in the future? And uh, as was mentioned earlier, um, for those of you who are interested in the publications and funding, please do come forward uh, to support, you know, the, the, the making sure that this knowledge goes out into the community and the whole of the Pacific. Thank you, I just thought I'd add that. All right, any final comments or questions? Yes? Noaya Maori, my name is Hezekiah. I'm a final year law student with the University of South Pacific, and I am from the Rotuma Islands. Um, this is not a question, but just gratitude. The Rotuma Islands, um, according to the UN, is known as one of the islands within the Pacific uh, region that is losing its culture and its language. So the fact that we are here today launching three publications in encouraging and pushing for our cultures to stay with us, to be with us, and to remain with us, not only for now, but for the future, is just amazing. And then to be part of the launching, I just want to share my genuine appreciation and gratitude. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right.
Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Anne Cheryl, and I'd like to thank the ladies who are sitting before us and gracing us with their presence. I would like to make a suggestion for the next book, and it is something that I feel really strongly about and something that I see as lacking. Um, we put, well, I am not from here, but as an educator here now, people tend to put Western methodologies to the fore, and they pay respect to Western methodologies. Mm -hmm. And if you are talking about reweaving the ecological mat, I think one of the compilations that you could do is a compilation on research frameworks and methodologies of the Pacific. And you have Conai sitting there. <laughs> so thank you very much. Any of our presenters like to respond to that? <laughs> Is this work? Yes. Um, just, just a quick answer to that. Um, I, I'm not, not so much about a compilation, but uh, what I have noticed is that in different policy areas uh, that I'm coming across in my work, uh, a lot of these, a lot of the research methodologies from from mm -hmm. the region are actually being used in in completely different policy areas beyond education, and and I think it's, uh, I mean, uh, I think it's really really important to see that and and to the the fact that the work that Konai has done and a lot of other uh, educationists, the theologians, is now being integrated in completely mm. different areas mm. of, uh, or different fields. And I think that's, that's really positive and, and shows that maybe things take time to, to change, but they are changing. Mm. Yeah. Um, yes, thank you, uh, and Cheryl, for reminding us about that. Um, and yes, Elise is right in the sense that slowly, slowly, um, some of our organizations, some of our people are uh, seriously looking at the processes that I mentioned earlier and trying to, to use um, so-called Pacific uh, methodologies of, in the case that Anshara is talking about in, in research. Mm -hmm. um, what I find quite ironic is that, well, perhaps it's not ironic, perhaps it's just natural, that when you get the, the leadership, when the leadership is, is inclusive, when the leadership values Pacific-centered whatever, things are easier, things happen. Um, it's like, sorry, uh, to use, uh, um, uh, they make Taylor here. When you see a woman heading up something like the forum secretariat, what does that do to you as a woman, mm. right? Or as a young woman, as a girl, you can say, wow, I can aspire to that, okay? I can do that. If a woman can do that, I can do that. I will aspire to that. When you see a Pacific Islander, you know, successfully doing something, then what, do, what is that talking about? among the young people. Mm. So it is very, very important for us to, in our behavior, in our performance, to, um, to give the young people the knowledge that they need in terms of motivating them to do the, you know, take up leadership positions. Unfortunately, some of our very important institutions have leaders that do not value they say they value it. They say Pacific knowledge is important. Pacific methods are important. Women are important. But the action is not there, right? And so you end up with an institution. I'm sorry to be personal here. I've been at USB since 1974. We, at the, as I speak, we have probably two or one and a half, or maybe only one and one quarter. I am only working for six months on a part-time basis. How many women 
professors are there at USP. You can you go find out. After 50 years, mm. it's not a gender-friendly place in terms of looking at our staff, particularly at the senior level. So we can talk at USP about gender equality until the cows come home, if you have cows, <laughs> where you come from. But we are not doing anything about gender equality. You see what I mean? And this is part of the big issue in terms of when we talk about our cultures being important, do we, do we value the Oceania Center for Arts and Culture and Pacific Studies? No. We don't have the en a high enrollment. We don't have many students doing Pacific Studies. We are now just beginning to offer professional certificates and diplomas in our heritage arts, in arts. But when the university needs entertainment for some important guests coming here, who do they look to? The Oceania Center, the dancers. The singers, you see what I mean? So we've got to value our own cultures first and do something about it. If you're in a leadership position, do something about it because we can't just speak about how important our cultures are. We've got to do something about it. And then the young people can then sit up and say, ha, we can aspire to do that. Enough. say something on that? I don't want to let this uh, evening go because, in, as you know, my term will be coming to an end <coughs> early next year. And um, if one thing I'm going to leave behind is my s serious concern about the confidence of young women. Mm. We are educating women, but what I find in my own workplace, and we're doing extra work on this amongst our, our our women um, staff, and especially the young ones that are coming in, is to try to find ways to build their confidence so that they can get up and, and give, a, give a speech or give a talk amongst ourselves first and then they'll hold public once because there is a tremendous lack, I mean, there's a real lack of confidence. Now, if you look at what's happening across the region compared to other parts of the world, we are way behind in representation, in parliaments, in senior positions in civil service, at universities, etc. This time next year, there will be uh, no women in the senior management of the Pacific Island Forum Secretariat unless a woman is appointed as Secretary General. So I'm drumming it into all the male directors. Uh, I'm, I'm going to be on watching you. But it's really trying to build, uh, and same with SPC, when Audrey mm -hmm. leaves at the end of the year, there'll be positions open, and I hope women apply for them, and I hope women are successful. But that's not enough, just having a few people in senior positions. It's about what is it that's holding young women back. In isolated incidents, uh, when we were doing the consultation with uh, USP students on the 2050 strategy and looking at drivers. There was a discussion around education and about women in leadership positions and my question was, well, how are we going to get you there? Because there was a young woman in the, in the audience and she was nodding away and, and she said to me one at a, at a private conversation, I am going to be one day Prime Minister. <laughs> but the question there is, she, I mean, the issue is she's got these ambition, she's mm. got vision, she's got dreams, huh? but how are we going to get a lot of women through these hoops? Not to be just, you know, I think leaders, the word leadership can sometimes just, um, is overused, huh? but it's about how women are really respected, how women are uh, listened to within the region. Mm -hmm. Now we come from different parts of the Pacific, and in some of your cultures, women have a respected place. But in parts of Papua New Guinea, particularly, our brother here comes from Millen Bay and they're matrilineal. <laughs> so it's different to where I come from, which is very pat patrilineal. But it's women being given the opportunity to be 
to be able to participate in the economy, to have the skill sets to be able to do that, to not be abused. All these issues, we sometimes we romanticise it all about how wonderful our culture is in the Pacific. Mm -hmm. It is important. And as our young brother from Nauru said, we've got to know where we come from, who we are, what our culture is, but we've also got to make sure that if those, those um, of us who want to see the advancement of women are also playing a big role in making sure that women have their, their voices heard and, and are respected within their communities. Thank you. Mine will be very short. Um, Upolu Vai from uh, Pacific Philosophical College. Um, first of all, I would like to follow up what Meg was saying. And I really appreciate looking at all the women controlling um, the, the mat tonight in a discussion. And I think it's, it's about time for us men just to sit back and relax and sometimes shut up, um, but to listen to women. And I think it's a challenge, not only in the sectors, but also in the church in particular, especially the role of women uh, in, in, in the church. So um, I would like to acknowledge that, uh, the importance of your contribution. The role and the vision of the Pacific Theological College is really to engage in a more um, interdisciplinary in a more um, in a, in a, into a kind of approach that brings together the sectors, the uh, church, um, governments uh, in a more interrelational, interconnected um, way to discuss issues. And I think that was really made clear in Meg's um, uh, keynote address uh, uh, for tonight. So these publications are part of the contribution of the church towards development. Mm -hmm. Perhaps um, part of the contributions of the many other contributions mm -hmm. that are coming up in a, in a way that it's about time for the church to stand up and contribute, not only contribute, but really shape the development story and the policies within especially the role of spirituality. And when I say spirituality, spirituality in a more holistic way, not spirituality confined to the church, but spirituality in a more holistic way. And I think that's very important. So therefore, there's one more book coming up, um, and that is Pacific uh, Philosophies. And the reframing of development through uh, the wisdom of Oceania. Um, that book was the product of, uh, of um, the inaugural Pacific uh, Philosophy Conference. Um, and of course, Konai is one of the contributors because um, many of the, of the elders uh, from around the region are contributing to that. The importance of our own philosophy um, and values and spirituality to the changing of this um, development story. So I hope, Meg, that you don't retire uh, soon until you launch this book again, um, perhaps part all part of this series of the contribution of the churches mm -hmm. and the Pacific Theological College to the changing of the development story uh, within the region. Um, having said that, I would like to also perhaps to add to the uh, acknowledgement tonight to again thank you, Meg, for your time and thank you to all these beautiful ladies, uh, my mentor and my always my teacher Konai uh, for everything that she has done also and for everyone. Also, I would like to acknowledge the director of the Institute of Mission and Research uh, for Mission and Research, Isaki Kasimira. He's the one that has been leading and making this all possible. Thank you. <laughs>